Today, Mariana Gerstenbluth will lead a single paper presentation entitled Repugnant Warnings, Addiction and Rational Choice. Professor Gerstenbluth is an economist who studies topics in health economics, behavioral economics, risky behavior, and smoking. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at Universidad de la República, located in Montevideo, Uruguay. She also trained in economics at Universidad de la República. Our discussant today is Catherine McLean. Professor Gerstenbluth will be presenting her research in three segments, and we'll have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Professor Gerstenbluth, thanks for presenting for us today. Okay, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to share my, my screen. Can you see it there? Yes. Okay. So first of all, sorry for my English. I'll try to do my best, but I speak Spanish, so <laughs> sorry. Um, this is a paper, I, I, it's from a bigger research program I have with Jeffrey Harris from MIT and Patricia Triunfo from my university. Uh, we have two experiments. I'm going to talk a bit about the first one, just in order to introduce the second one, that is the one I'm going to talk about now. Okay. I have no industry funding and no conflict of interest to declare, and we had some, finan some financial support from the, the tobacco control program from the Ministry of Public Health in, in Uruguay. So let me talk to you a bit about my motivation. Uruguay has a very, very strong anti-tobacco policy. Uh, it started in 2005. We had a, a president that was an oncologist and he was very, very worried and concerned about smoking. So he, he introduced a very, very strong anti-tobacco campaign. And we have many things that were done, but for example, uh, it's forbidden to smoke in public places. 80% uh, of the packages are covered by a warning. Um, ad advertisement, uh, advertisement, sorry, is of tobacco products is banned everywhere. Uh, we have a, 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 a rise in prices given by very strong taxes. Um, we have one version of every brand. That means that you cannot have uh, things like light or mild or blue and, and colors regarding different types of the same brand. And we don't have e-cigarettes. Maybe I can talk a little more about a little bit more about that later. So the last stage of the campaign was to introduce a uh, plain packaging. So we first ran an experiment that was just to assess the riskiness, the perception of riskiness of plain packaging, where we made people uh, choose between regular packages and plain packages. That was done before the implementation of plain packaging. And that's, so that's part of our, our motivation, what we saw there. And then we also know that these are more theoretical things that humans routinely make decisions in violating, in violation, sorry, of the normative actions of rationality. There are several experiments since Versky in the 70s that take account of that. We also know that aversive stimuli and negative emotions interfere with rational decision making. That's very important in the case of addiction and smoking in, in particular. And we also have some prior economic research on rational addiction that focus mostly on the smoker's ability to make farsighted rather than myopic utility maximizing consumption choices. That's the famous Gruber and Kosegi paper about uh, rational choice with time consistency. And there's a traditional results of the Becker and Murphy model that a cigarette smoker can still make rational decisions within the confines of his addiction. So what we want to assess is the role of addiction in economic behavior, in particular of smokers. And it's important to consider strategies, other strategies when making tobacco policy or anti-smoking policy. You have to know how they behave in order to put appropriate taxes, to know what to do with advertisement, what to do with the tobacco products you are selling and so on. 
So our main motivation is to study how consumers choose instead of how they should if they behave rationally. So that's more or less what, what we are concerned about. So here is uh, what we do. So we know that smokers, sorry that I can see, okay. Smokers made binary choices between experimental cigarette packages with varying and mostly repulsive warnings and background colors in the context of plain packaging. I'm going to explain later what a plain package is in I think the audience know them, but just in case you don't know. We made them decide which of the two packages contain the cigarettes they considered less risky for their health. And after that, we test whether smokers confronted with repugnant and threatening experimental warnings could still make choices that adhere to the classic actions of rational choice. And what is like new and innovative maybe is that we supplemented our observations on smoker choices with data on their eye movements. That is, we used an eye tracker to see, to follow their eye movements. After that, we made a semi-structured interview that it's like a very common thing to do after an eye tracking uh, task. So, let me see. Okay, here we have an example of plain packaging. It's written in Spanish because it's the advertisement of the, the package we have now in Uruguay. We, it wasn't on the streets when we made the experiment and this is very important because people didn't know what a plain package was when we, did the, we ran the experiment. But it's a, an homogeneous time of packaging where you have the removal of everything related to branding. So the font of the letters is the same in every package. 80% of the pa package front and back is covered by warning. A warning is uh, together the image and the text. Here, for example, you have a very horrible warning where you have a baby and it says that smoking can harm the fetus. And you have the brand here, where it says Marca. Marca means brand in Spanish. You have some things regarding to what is in the cigarettes and the color, that is something that is important too. That is the same for all the packages. So even if you have a Malboro, Camel, Lucky Strikes, whatever brand you have, they, are, they all look the same. Okay? So just... In case I don't get to the end, we, what we find, we expected that smokers exposed to these repugnant and threatening images would make noisy decisions, but we observed the opposite. So the vast majority made very stable choices. That means that participants universally made choices consistent with a complete transitive and context independent preference ordering. We find little evidence of inconsistent choices. In a majority of smokers, we find strong evidence of the use of a noise-reducing lexicographic decision rule just to, to assess the riskiness of a, of a cigarette package. I'm going to explain a bit more why it's a lexicographic decision rule. And our findings support a model in which the addiction permits the smoker to suppress aversive stimuli and negative emotions that would otherwise interfere with short-term rational decision-making. I'm going to talk a lot more about all this stuff later. So let me explain you a bit how the experimental task was. We had 12 choice sets. They were shown on a computer monitor with two cigarette packs each of the sets that vary in warning and background color. For each set, the participant was asked to click his mouth pointer on the cigarette that was less risky for your health that's what we ask them, not what you're going to buy. We ask them which product, which package do you consider has a product that is less risky for your health. And it was a forced choice design. So you have to choose if in order to go on with the experiment. During the task, an eye tracker recorded participants' eye movement. We had two groups just in order to randomize the sequential order, right, left. And we had 98 smokers, they were between 19 and 60 years, and they were students, faculty, and staff of my university. And after, after that, we had a 
retrospective stories think aloud task. That is what I, I called a semi-structured interview earlier. So here are some descriptive statistics of our participants. They are mostly female, they are young, 28.2 years old is the mean. They are very educated, that is because we made it in the university. They don't smoke that much, 84.5% smoke less than 20 cigarettes per day. But 60% smoke one cigarette uh, in the first hour they, they arise. So that's a, a sign of, of addiction. And then we have some just control questions. Here we have an example of choice sets. They are written in Spanish. I'm going to translate you what that means. Here we have the four images. These are examples of two choice sets, and, but in, I choose them in order to show you the four images. We have the, the four warnings, and we have uh, the first one is a fetus on a hand, and it says smoking during pregnancy can harm your baby's health. The second one is a tag on a cadaver, and it says smoking can cause a heart attack. The third one, it's a boot stamping out some, some cigarettes, and it says take the first step today, quitting, quit smoking is possible. And the third one is a tumor on a mouth, and it says smoking causes bad breath, tooth loose, and mouth cancer. We have three colors, as you can see there, uh, light brown, that is the first one, gray, that is the second and the last one, and a dark brown, that is the third one. This dark brown color, it's Pantone 448C, something like that, <laughs> that is the color that is actually in the packages of Uruguay now, and is the color that Australia, that was the first country to, to implement plain packaging, uh, they used, they, made a lot of research to choose the color and they choose this one. This uh, Orly is a brand that it doesn't exist. We made it up just to, you know, to do the, the experiment. It was important to have a brand that was not known by, the, by our participants. And here uh, it says that this product contains nicotine, tar and carbon monoxide. That's what it says there, and this is just a toxicity symbol. These kind of packages are in many countries by now. The first one was Australia. There are many countries in, the, in Europe that have them, like France, the UK. Uh, there are some countries in Asia. I know, for example, Thailand introduced it last year, I think, uh, plain packaging. I know in the US you don't have in packaging, but I know that the FDI approved something about 50% uh, of the package covered by a warning, but there was a motion by the industry, so it's postponed. I, I know there's, I have read something about it, but these are examples of our choice sets. What's eye tracking? Eye tracking is a non-invasive tracking of the eyes, where you record the trajectories and times where the eyes stop. So it gives us very useful information in order to understand how people decide, particularly economic decisions. It's very cheap. It's expensive to have an eye tracker, but after you, you have it, it's very easy and, and it's cheap. You, you just have to pay your participants the way you decide to do it. And they are very short experiments. And as an attention measure, it helps us to understand how visual information is, is processed. So those are more or less the benefits of it. Mariana, yeah. sorry, did you want to pause for... Um, yes, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that, that's okay. Um, great. So if anyone in the audience has questions, you can type them into the Q&A panel. And uh, first, I'll, I'll let Catherine uh, have first shot if she has any questions. Great, thanks so much, Mariana. I just have a couple of questions about sort of some technical aspects of this. I noticed you have a forced response. Uh, I know there's you know there's different thoughts on what, when you may or may not want to impose the forced choice. I guess what I'm thinking is with these sort of um, threatening um, uh, messages. Do you think that like wouldn't why did you choose that? Because wouldn't it be also be interesting to know if those 
potential um, images sort of shifted people away from using any of the products. Um, I just like to know more about why you why you made that decision and what you think about the implications. Yeah, I uh, we we know <laughs> we are very concerned about that too. The truth is that is it was very difficult to make the experiment if we didn't have a, a forced choice. Uh, I think you can have uh, ties or maybe people that don't want to decide which is the, the, the less risky package. So I think it might be better not to have a forced choice experiment. I completely <laughs> agree with that. But the thing is that technically we had to do it this way. Uh, but I, I, I take into account your comment <laughs> seriously because uh, we, we know that uh, limitation. Actually, we have we ran another experiment where we could uh, we could correct that. So maybe in some months I present you the other experiment and I tell you about it. Future work, future work. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Always lots of interesting things to do. Um, another question I had is about the use of the fake brand. Um, I hear that there's your comments that there it's important to have the, have this something that's stable, perhaps across the different the individuals in terms of use. But are you concerned that perhaps if these are smokers, if they recognize this is not a brand that they are that is available on the market, do you think that would have any impact on the way? they responded to your questions or your choice sets? Yeah. Well, I can tell you that the decision not to use any uh, actual brand, it be, it's because, uh, for example, I don't know, here in Uruguay, we don't have the same brands that you have, but some of them we do. And for example, there are some brands that people tend to think that they are stronger or they are worse, or so we cannot use them. Uh, that everybody thinks, I don't know, for example, here, everybody thinks that Malboro cigarettes are stronger than other brands, for example. Or other thing is that maybe you can think that the brand you smoke, because remember, these are all smokers, that the brand you smoke is less risky and you have a tendency to choose the brand you smoke just because it's the one you know. So we, we thought, uh, we we thought it was better not to use actual brands. Before they started with the, with the experiment, we gave them, uh, uh, we explained them the rules and we told them that they were going to see images of packages with a brand that does not exist and everybody knew that and it was not a problem. But th that's the reason why we did it that way. Okay, uh, uh, thanks. I know that's always a tricky decision to make. Um, with the eye tracking, I think you say that it, you indicate that it's non-invasive. To the respondent, are they, does it just look like a computer screen or um, do they notice the tracking in any ways? Um, and were they aware that their, that their eyes would be tracked? Yes, yes, yes. They knew that their eye movements were going to be tracked. So they, they know, they knew everything when they started doing the, the experiment, but it's, and maybe I can show you, I have a, an image here of how it works. <laughs> so they don't have anything on their faces or their heads. The eye tracker is in the screen. So it's recording your eye movements without you even notice it. So it's not invasive and they knew that. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll and, let you proceed. Yeah, Marianne, you're, you're welcome to continue. Okay, thank you. So as, uh, as Catherine asked, this is a, an example of, of an eye tracker. Uh, you have, it's, it's in the screen, so you don't have anything on you. You don't have glasses or, or anything. And it tracks your eye movements. And this is an example of what you can see when you, when you do the eye tracking task. You have this kind of a heat map with the times people fixate in every part of these two packages. This is just in order to show you. Uh, when we do an eye tracking experiment, you have to define your areas of fixation because you, you have to tell the software where you take care of people 
looking at because it's not the same for me if they look i don't know whatever that in these areas we consider were important that are defined as the areas of fixation we have the text the image remember remember the warning is the image plus the text but as areas of fixation we divided them into the text and the image separately the brand name the toxicity symbol here it says toxic product and the lateral text that it's what i told you before that it says this product contains nicotine tan and carbon monoxide so these are the areas of, of fixation um, that are where the software is going to tell us that people looked at this is an example of the eye tracking data acquisition process and here i have to explain two things that it's what is defined as a fixation and what is important to define a fixation when you move your eyes quickly it's not a fixation it's a cicade and it's when you take a look at that when you spend less than 50 milliseconds taking a look at some point when you have more than 50 milliseconds you define us as a fixation it's important because neuroscientists not me <laughs> define that 50 milliseconds is the minimum amount of time you need for the image to get into the fovea in the eye and that's when you are actually paying attention so as fixations are uh, what indicate us that people are paying attention they are a measure of attention we need fixations we need gazes that sp when people spend more than 50 milliseconds taking a look at some point so that's a fixation and that's what we care about cicades we don't care so this is an example of a choice set where we have these two packages and this person spent first 180 milliseconds taking a look at this image then five milliseconds taking a look anywhere we don't care we don't know it's not on a area of interest and then 580 milliseconds taking a look at this at this image so this is like the acquisition the data acquisition process works so i'm going to bore you with some theory uh, the objects of choice are packages they they are consisting for our interest in two things that are warnings and background colors that's the only thing we are going to to worry about warnings are the booth the cadaver the fetus and the mouth that i showed you before and the background colors are the gray the light brown and the dark brown and our our uh, things of objects of interest are, are composed by these two things the warning and the background they are a combination of them and we have binary choice sets that are composed by x and x prime that are two different cigarette packages you always have cigarette that vary in something at least in color or, or at least in the warning so x is different from x prime we want a preference that preferences that are context independent because confronted with the same set at different points we have you have to consistently choose x over x prime if in one set you choose over x over x prime you have to choose it uh, in another set you can have possible contextual elements you can have positioning effects that it's maybe you always choose what it's on the right side of the screen or what it's on the left side of the screen this is very important because when you if people that uh, in our case that uh, reads and and writes in spanish you have the tendency to start from the left side maybe if you run this experiment in israel uh, you you can have the other position in effect so it's important to take them into account and you can have order effects it's a very well known thing and it's studied since Tversky many years ago you can have learning and fatigue in your experiment people can learn what they have to do or they can just get tired and bored of the the thing and just click their mouth anywhere and it's also important to check that you have transitivity in order not to have preference cycles when you have these things you can have a utility function 
and you, we can have, we suppose we have additive utility, that is that the utility of the package comes from the warning plus the background, the utility from the warning plus the utility of the background. An additive utility allows for compensatory decision making. That is, you compare the utility coming from the background and the utility coming from the warning, the background color, sorry, and the warning. And if it's positive, you choose, you choose X over X prime or the other way. But we can have a lexicographic decision rule. The lexicographic decision rule for those who are not uh, in these things, it's like a, like things are ordered in a dictionary. You first uh, you want to search for a word, and first you look at the first uh, letter. Then, if you have a tie in the first letter, you look at the second letter, and that way. So you can you can have a preference order that it's lexicographic in our case, for example, and that's what we have that uh, you choose x over x prime if the utility from the warning in the first package is higher than the utility of the warning in the second package or if you have a tie regarding the warning then you take a look at the background color and you decide this is non-compensatory compared to the other that we had before and what is important is that a lexicographic rule is a noise reducing heuristic so it's like and it's an heuristic and it's an easier way to make the decision. In this case, you can also include ordering and positioning effects like constant dependency or something like that, as I told you before. Here we have some results of our non-parametric tests where we tested context independence, transitivity, additive utility and lexicographic utility. What is important is that we have uh, 63 participants out of 97 passed all the six tests. So that's a very high amount of people. And we have, uh, for example, transitivity was passed by 97 for, by all the participants. And I'm going to tell you just uh, how we did this in, with one example. For example, test number two, we had three sets that compared a cadaver with mouth, boot with cadaver. I'm just going to talk about the warning, not the background color in this case, and mouth and boot. And for example, if in the first one you chose cadaver over boot, and in the second one you chose boot over, over cadaver, you know that in the third one they have to choose boot over mouth, and all of them passed this test. Then you can have, a, for example, a test for lexicographic utility, and I'm going to explain you what happened in test number three. You have mar mouth dark brown and cadaver dark brown, and you have cadaver gray and mouth dark brown, and you always, they chose always mouth, uh, sorry, cadaver over mouth, no matter what the background color was, they don't care. But in the last test, as you have a tie regarding the warning, then you take a look at the background color to decide. How am I with time? I think you're doing well. You, okay. Um, yeah. I have to hurry. <laughs> um, so then we have some parametric models. To run a conditional logic model, that is what we did, you have to assume that you have an additive utility. So you have to assume that you have rational choice. I'm going to pass very quick through this because what is important is that everything is, is oh, I don't have my stars there, sorry. Is that everything is significant. And we, it, this was very useful to run a, a test of lexicographic preferences. That is the cue you see here in the bottom of the slide. And we cannot reject that we have lexicographic preferences. So that's another clue about it. And we also use the, the results of this model to compute uh, utilities. So that we are going to use later, I'm going to show you. Regarding our uh, eye tracking results specifically, we have response times and we have the, the sequential order. We have a, 
sets from 1 to 3, 4 to 6, 7 to 9, and 10 to 12. And what we have here is the response time in seconds from those warnings, those sets, sorry, that had distinct warnings and those that had identical warnings. So they vary in color only. As you can see, when you have identical warnings, you have much longer response times in all the cases. And as you can see also, it, the time, response time declines as you go advanced with the, with the experiment. That can be a clue about fatigue or learning. This is also a, a something that, that is talking us about lexicographic preferences because this doesn't happen with colors. I forgot to tell you that, it's very important. We don't have this when we have distinct colors or identical colors. Then we have response time. Here we, what we have is the response time in, in, and the difference in utility between, between the, the different packages in the same set. So as you can see here, with higher response times, we have B, G, and H as you can see there, and D, these are the sets that have the same warning. So it's more difficult for people to make the decision when they are confronted to the same warning in both uh, packages on the same set. So this is another thing that is talking us about lexicographic preferences. This is just how the eye tracking search patterns are. When you have identical warning and distinct warnings, what is important here is how they look. And we know that first they look at one warning and most of them then take a look at the other warning instead of looking everywhere, elsewhere, sorry. Here we have the, the number of non-warning fixations. You remember that we had eight, uh, eight areas of fixation defined. One was the, the text plus the image that was the, the warning. And we have that, uh, we have the sequential order here too. And the number of fixations outside the warning is very high in the first sets, but it comes down as they go on. So this is how maybe you can have here another clue about learning and, and fatigue. And Mariana, I, I think you were gonna Pause I'm here, here as well. Here, yeah. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, Catherine, do you have any questions? Yes, I just have uh, a couple of questions, and some of them are a little more uh, technical, and some of them are a little more, I guess, conceptual. Um, one question I had is uh, you have, I noticed you have 97 respondents, and I think you're doing 12 choices per, per respondent. Yeah. Were you, um, are you, did you do any sort of power analysis ex ante just um, to kind of know how powered you are to detect these? Yes, effects? yes, we did it, we did it, yes. I, I don't have the, the results here, but we did it and, and it was okay. And I have to tell you that it, it was maybe mostly for economists, uh, 98 participants is not a big number, but uh, in eye tracking experiments, 98 participants is a lot of people. <laughs> they are mostly less than 50 people. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, another question I have is, did you look at any heterogeneity in the effects across different individuals? I guess I'm wondering is, are there differences across maybe uh, experience smoking or age or education uh, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking perhaps if you are a more experienced smoker, you've learned ways to sort of look away from uh, repungent messages and focus on other aspects. And if you looked at that heterogeneity, did you observe any evidence of that? Yes, we did it. In particular, we were very concerned about, you know, you, I don't know if you remember, but one of the warnings had a fetus, a dead fetus yes. on, a, on a hand. And we thought that maybe that was more... Uh, horrible for women than for men. And we didn't find anything regarding that. And, but we, what we did is we compared the results between what we called violators and non-violators. That is what I'm going to, to show you right now. And we have some differences, but we, we, the, we had a problem, I think, and is that our population is very homogeneous. They are very educated and we don't have many differences there. 
and they are young. So we, we didn't have uh, like the heterogeneity in, the, in our participants, enough heterogeneity to, to test for that things, but I think it would be very, very useful. So okay. thanks for the comment. <laughs> Uh, thank you. That's a great answer. Um, I, just another question, thinking about your you're indicating that in these samples can be smaller because it's it was just a, a you know a big effort to put to collect this kind of these kind of data. Um, with the fact that people know that they're 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 going to be tracked, um, I guess what I'm wondering is, are you at all concerned about any potential like gaming on the part of the individuals? And in particular, or I guess another question is. Um, did you have a lot of people who elected not to participate? Um, and could you speak a bit about sort of selection, selection into or out of the sample? I, with the background that I fully understand that you know, every experiment is potentially, including my own, is, are potentially uh, subject to the concerns about generalizability. But I guess what I'd really like to know is, do you think there could be any gaming on the part of people who are in, in, your, in your sample? Um, and are you concerned about that the eye tracking may have systematically led people to say, no, I don't want to participate? Yeah. Well, we had, it wasn't that hard to, to recruit people. We, we were very quite successfully when we did it. We tried to have people from uh, other places, not just the university, and that was hard. We wanted, for example, in Uruguay, we have the, the problem that uh, people that work on, the, on construction, uh, like construction workers, they are the, the people that, they are the heaviest smokers in Uruguay. They, they still smoke, they don't quit, they, we, we, there's a very really big problem there. We wanted, we made some arrangements and we tried to recruit them and we couldn't because I think you have to incentivize them <laughs> with, uh, I don't know, with money or whatever, and we couldn't do that. So it was, it was hard. And I don't know, maybe people feel, felt, uh, I don't know, I think it, they were uh, happy to participate in an experiment with eye tracking. So I don't know if, if it was a, a problem, but I, we also know that you cannot generalize these results. You know, in, in, all, in every economic experiment, we have this problem. And in these cases in particular, when you have very small samples of, of people. So yeah, I, I, I'm concerned about that too. <laughs> Sure, and we, we all are. It's uh, definitely uh, you know, a very something we all think about. Just want interested to hear your thoughts. Um, I have a question here from one of our panelists um, yeah. who is wondering if these studies are helping to understand the effects of plain packaging or are using plain packaging as an experimental tool um, and the data aren't as relevant to the impact of plain packaging. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you have any questions and if our panelist has uh michelle feels i've not correctly asked that question please let me know how better to ask it okay um well the first experiment we did it was to to assess the riskiness of the packages it was just to to it was it had a, a policy obligation immediately and when we ran this one, we wanted to, to assess the riskiness of different warnings. We were just trying to evaluate different warnings and background colors. That was the, the, the main objective of this, of this experiment. But um, we had another <laughs> objectives. And now we, we after that, we run another one, another experiment, and now we are more concerned about how people choose and not only the package itself. So it's beyond uh, the tobacco policy in, 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 in the package itself. Thank you. Um, okay, I, I would actually jump in with one question before we move on. Actually, two related questions related to the eye tracking exercise. Um, 
So is it ever done that you adjust for the size of the component? So for example, the image covers most of the package. So if people were looking at random, you might expect them to um, look at the image. That's one part. And the, the second is whether you, um, you showed that people tend to fixate on the warning. And I was curious if that is the image plus the text or just the image itself. And moreover, whether the text seems to, like whether people do read the, the text versus look at the image um, based on sort of what they look at first or how long they, they look at each. So basically. Um, okay. I'm going to start with the second one. Um, maybe I think the audience and you know that it's a debate whether warnings uh, are supposed to have just a text or an image plus a text. Um, there are many countries where warnings are only text and we wanted to, to see what, what was better and we know from this experiment and there is some other evidence that people are, take a look much more at the images than at the text. So it's important to have an image, we, we think so. And it's important to have a text that leaves a message uh, beyond the image. Sometimes images are difficult to understand. Uh, maybe if you don't have a text explaining, you don't understand that you see it, for example, our mouth, the one that we have with the mouth, you can see that it's a disgusting image, but you cannot really understand what's going on there. So it's important to have a, a, a text explaining. So I think I answered you the second question. <laughs> Regarding the size, the thing is that is, uh, we have a law that it says that 80% of the package has to be covered by the warning that it's the text plus the image. So maybe you can vary it, but just for, for our interest, but it's not going to have any interest uh, regarding the, the, the tobacco policy because that it's done and nobody is willing to change it, I think. So we couldn't make any changes, but you can have some differences. I think it would be good to do it. Yeah, and it wouldn't matter unless it was sort of differential, which there's no reason yeah. to think that it is across the images, but I, I was just curious whether that gets done ever. Um, yeah. Anyway, you're, you're welcome to keep going um, uh, with your presentation. Okay, thank you. So when Catherine asked me about differences in or heterogeneity among our, our participants, what I can tell you is that we, separate, we split it our, after we had our, the results, we split it our sample in violators and non-violators. We called non-violators to the 65% of the participants that passed all the six tests of additive and lexicographic utility. And we called violators to the one that didn't pass the tests. And we saw some regularities among them. They, they were not heavier smokers, but they, they, uh, that was a surprise because we thought, okay, maybe they are heavier smokers, but that was not the case. Or there's nothing, there isn't any social demographic characteristic that is special or different between violators and non-violators. But these violators had much longer response times. They had much more fixations and much more fixations outside the warning. And they also had positioning effects. So they have much noisier uh, decisions. And, and that's important and we want to, to deepen in, in that thing in, in another, in future work. <laughs> so what we find. Uh, nearly all participants made choices that satisfied rational choice, including context, independence, and transitivity. Most of them appear to use a lexicographic rule. Oh, I have a typo there. A lexicographic rule as a noise reducing heuristic. The eye tracking showed us that the sequence of eye fixations is consistent with that lex lexicographic strategy. Violators smoke less, made noisier decisions, they had longer response times, right side bias, more fixations, and all the noisier things you can think about. And non-violators were better able to block aversive stimuli and make a, a rational choice. So I think what we have to ask at the end is how can these addicted smokers be rational? And within the, the confines of their addiction, they acted rationally. 
this is a demonstration that addiction, I don't know if a demonstration, but it talks about that, about the, the thing that addiction induces the decision maker to selectively ignore aversive stimuli in order to make narrow, narrow decisions that at least superficially adhere to the axiom of rationality. These results, I didn't talk about it, but are consistent with a drift diffusion model. These are, uh, uh, these are decision models that are very, very, very well known in neuroeconomics or neurosciences in general. And it, they are related to the costs and the benefits of acquiring more information or spending more time trying to get more information until you make a decision. So our results are consistent with that. And it's necessary to think about models of addiction involving two potentially conflicting internal decision-making pathways. This is like the traditional shelling uh, and, and Taylor and Sheffering results. So where do we go from here? Future work, <laughs> future and present work. It's important to study the relative importance of fixation on image versus text, not just the warning together. We have to study more what happens with learning and fatigue in this kind of experiments. We want to know, and this is, this is very important, if what's the relationship between fixations and preferences, that it's top-down versus bottom-up control. That means, do your preference drive your fixations, or is it the other way? No, that's, that's important to understand what in nitrogen is called the I-mind link. What drives what you choose? You take a look at what you prefer or is it the other way? We have to deepen in this addiction choice relation and we are working on, on the results of a new experiment now. So that's all and thank you very much for your comments and hearing me. Great, thanks so much. Um, Catherine, do you have any further questions? I just have a couple of questions if, uh, if there's a moment. Uh, thanks for that great presentation, Mariana. Um, I was just wondering, in your follow-up survey, your, your survey to your experiments, did you ask any questions about sort of difficulties that respondents had maybe viewing these images? And I guess what I'm wondering is, did, the, did you get any reports that these images were just made it hard to understand what was what the choices that were being made because they are so threatening? Yes, it's, uh, we, we have a lot of information about that. I told you that we had a, 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 I think, a loud task that what is that that is made for. You ask people what they, you show them, the eye fixation pattern, and you said, okay, this is what you did. Tell me why you choose what you choose and why you take a look where you took a look. And they, they tell us, things like, oh, that image was so disgusting that I couldn't uh, took a look at it, so I chose the other one. Or I think, um, I don't know, I think the boot was a very positive message, so I always choose the boot or something like that. Yes, we have. I, I didn't have time enough to to explain it, but we had we had that, that yeah. So hard to get everything into a presentation. You did a fantastic job. Uh, just one other question for me, and then I'll have a question from the panelist. Um, you had the twelve choices. Did you um, did you exclude any of those choices and reestimate your models to kind of try and get at the fact that maybe there was fatigue at the, or learning at the end? Yes, the we tried to. We 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 tested if we had a learning of fatigue because it's, it's difficult to distinguish it. It's just we wanted to know if there was an ordering uh, effect and we didn't find it but we have some clues that there might be something there sure uh, and just from one of our participants um could you uh just uh define uh rational choice just for some of our our, uh, our participants so they're clear on that okay um you have rational choice when you adhere to the traditional act uh, actions of rational choice sorry and it means that your your preferences are transitive that means if you choose a over b and then you choose b uh, and, and then you choose a uh, c over b you're going to choose a over c so that's transitivity and that's one thing you have when you have a rational choice you need your preference to be complete that means that you always can order 
things. You have to choose between A, B, and C. You can order. I prefer B over C over A and, and, and not to change it. And I think those are the most important things and they are very axiomatic. They are really like, I don't know, basic. That's great. I just one more question. Um, do you think this experiment would disentangle the impact of warning messages from the impact of images? Can we test the interact interaction effect between warnings and images? Warnings referring to text? We cannot do that because every image and, uh, is accompanied by the same text because the warning is the text and the image together. We, th we think we, it might be useful to mix them, but it has to have sense because you cannot talk about the fetus and have an image of a boot stamping out cigarettes. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you. That was um, great answers to the questions, and um, really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. I would yes. jump in with. There's a, a couple more questions. Um, so one is uh, in the Q and A about um, why you couldn't incentivize. In this case, uh, he says construction workers or basically other non-university employees or students, I assume, um, to join the study. Um, and I, I'm, I'm curious if you could speak to that. I was waiting for that question. <laughs> and I, I guess just building on that, sort of maybe thinking about why uh, or, or how in, in the in, in your country context, sort of how having a university um, sample might, might affect the, the results in any way. Yeah. Okay, um, that's a very interesting question. It always comes sooner or later, <laughs> why we couldn't incentivize. Um, as most of you know, uh, it's good to incentivize people when you run a, an experiment. We couldn't do that and it's, the answer is very simple and it's because we were, we were not allowed by the ethics committee. We, this is the developing world, not, not the developed <laughs> in, in every sense. So it was very hard to get, because this was considered like a medical uh, experiment involving humans. So as we did that, um, we couldn't pay them in any way. So we just were allowed to give them a gift. So th that, that's a problem. We are now getting better in that uh, regarding ethics committees, and we, I think we can do better things, uh, but it was a problem. Yes, we are very concerned about that too. Okay, and uh, another question, this is in the chat, is um, asking whether you uh, ask participants to choose the one that they would purchase. Um, or did you, only, and I guess more generally, why did you choose to ask the less risky option instead of say the one they prefer, the one they intend to purchase? Yeah, uh, I think it's more suitable to think about purchasing a cigarette package if you actually incentivize people, you, you, you involve money in the experiment. So in that case, it would have been better, but we couldn't. And the other thing is that when you, in Uruguay, you cannot see, that's another thing of the policy that I didn't tell you, is that uh, cigarette packages are not shown on the stores. They are hidden. <laughs> so you have to ask for a cigarette pack and they bring it to you from, I don't know, something that, where you cannot see them. So you are never confronted to the package at the moment of buying a package of cigarettes. So I think it's a mixture of those two things that made us ask about riskiness and not what you're going to actually buy. Okay, and there's a question about the believability of the different warnings. Um, Mike Cummings, feel free to speak up if you have something further that you wanted to elaborate on that point, but I guess whether participants found the um, warnings to be believable. Um, yeah, uh, we, we had a, a long history of warnings before the experiment the people never saw those warnings that we showed them on the experiment but they were used to see uh, warnings that were that were very similar to those ones they had already seen uh, warnings with tumors not in the mouth but maybe something else something in another place 
or babies almost dying or things like that. So they, they are used to that. Okay. And another question, which goes back to the construction worker issue about whether this, uh, this is sort of what I was hinting at about whether there might be a difference in the findings for construction workers um, versus if you had uh, uh, your academic population. Yeah, yeah. Whether you would sure. expect the results to be different. Yes, we expect the results to be different. We couldn't do it because we couldn't pay them. That's the, the simple <laughs> answer, and basic answer. But it would be very interest to, interesting to have a, a heavy smoking population. Yeah. Okay, I think that is all the questions we have. Thanks so much. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor uh, Gersten Bluth for the presentation to the moderator and discussants. Uh, thank you to the audience for your participation. Our next seminar speaker will be Ann Burton, giving a presentation on April 1st titled The Impact of Smoking Bans in Bars and Restaurants on Alcohol Consumption, Smoking, and Alcohol-Related Externalities. After leaving the seminar, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Thanks again for participating and have a top-snatch weekend.